I'd always thought I'd want to do a book about it, but frankly, I thought I might have to wait till he was dead. Mm. So um, when he started seeming more open to talking about Quiz Kids and acknowledging that time in his life, that opened it up in a different way. I could actually do it when he was alive and maybe even use it as a way to, to make a connection with him and to uh, then, once his dementia developed, to pull him back. I did believe or thought that that was a possibility, and I didn't realize that it wasn't. There's a sense even in the end of the book, though, that he doesn't really necessarily want the story out there in the way that it is. Oh, no, yeah, no. It's He went through this phase, like I said, where he, he seemed very open to talking about quiz kids, and he, he even seemed a little eager for me to do a book. But then that went away again, and, you know, he uh, he went back to, he, he did at one point say, I don't think you should do this book. And that was at a point where I said, uh, I'm sorry, I've put in too much work. Yeah. on it at this point uh, I can't stop and he went okay then but you know clearly he'd, he'd never been really honest with himself about his feelings he thought he was ready to acknowledge it and be okay with it but I don't think he ever was and ever would be you, you had the manuscript he had started gotten what seemed like a, a few pages or a chapter or two into his own story he had written two chapters in 1974 and, and they're extremely kind of circularly written so that he doesn't actually talk about anything it's maddening to write to read writing like that there have been autobiographies published like that where you, you read it and at the end you say well you haven't said anything about your yeah. own life or what people are really curious about he defeated himself trying to do it you got the sense though that at least at some point in his life it was a story that he wanted to tell well you know i do think he had despite himself reached conclusions that he wanted to share mm. uh, especially his conviction that he had been uh promoted and and sort of manufactured because he was jewish and it was world war ii that yeah. was obviously something that had been at the back of his mind for a long time so i think there were things he kind of wanted to express but then as far as the rest of it and the celebrity culture which i'll admit i find intriguing i'm fascinated by movies and tv show and and radio from that era and i find it fascinating all the people he met and all the experiences he had and that was to him the least of it and something he didn't even want to acknowledge to him it was not worth acknowledging i think that's one of the things that's particularly interesting about it it is it's the, the this exact phenomenon the, the quiz kids phenomenon these children you know ages six or seven through 12 or 13 something like some somewhere in there well they were supposed to graduate when they were 16 and the youngest was five yeah i mean he was on it when he was five but a phenomenon that for a number of reasons just couldn't exist any other time than that exact moment it seems it was a really yeah it was a, a point on several graphs of the uh, yeah. acknowledgement of children as people which was a relatively <laughs> new thing that children weren't just malfunctioning adults that needed to be fixed they actually had charm and qualities that were special in and of themselves I think this was partly due to the rise of media and to the dropping of the child mortality rate because people found it easier to become attached to children if they weren't so convinced that a large percentage of them would die. And it was just uh, also a point on the graph of media itself. And then there was the war, which really uh, gave things, as I said, a, an urgency. It gave everything an urgency that it wouldn't have otherwise had. There is something lasting about the phenomenon, though, as far as the, the impact that it had on the pop culture of the time. Prior to reading it, I'm not familiar familiar with him. <laughs> right. It was a little before my time. When I heard the synopsis of the book and that, that he was your father, the first thing I thought of were, were those Salinger short stories. Right. The Salinger stories absolutely were inspired by Quiz Kids. The, yeah. And it became a theme in our culture, the idea of an intellectual family that's being displayed uh, on the media. Uh, continued into the work of, uh, you know, the Royal Tenenbaums and Magnolia. Magnolia, yeah. And, yeah, it's become a kind of idea in our culture, which is uh, so far removed from the reality as I, you know, saw it through uh, investigation. But it's become a kind of favorite idea. What do you think it is about it that it's had this lasting impact beyond the existence of any of those programs? Well, I think the idea that Salinger put forward, as it seemed to me in his stories, and that's been continued, is that the exposure in the public wouldn't change the intellectual capabilities or direction of the people involved. Mm. But it absolutely does. It absolutely does. So in those uh, books and movies, you have characters who are still passionately arguing about intellectual things and have not been corrupted by their experience in front of the public. Um, but I don't think that actually happens. Why Magnolia? Why the Tenenbaums? I mean, that makes sense. I mean, Salinger was a, a contemporary of these ideas. Why, why has it lasted beyond that? To me, yeah. Well, I think the answer is that it's 
uh, among the creative people involved, uh, the people who made those movies, for instance, um, it's an image that they're very fond of and yeah. they'd like to believe, even though it's it's almost certainly completely false. It was something that obviously he kept at a distance for for most of his adult life, certainly by the time that you came along. Did it play any role in your childhood? Just as a kind of undelinated, undescribed, but negative influence you know that something that people didn't acknowledge but at the same time it was marking a certain area of territory where we weren't supposed to go so i do feel like it emphasized just as far as something you couldn't discuss with him it was something we couldn't discuss with him but also it was known that that his experience had happened and that it had been negative for him and that to bring it up would cause him pain so it was also uh i think pretty clear to us that it was displaying that fame and attention were negative I, I think I very maybe lightly touched on it in the book or maybe not that much, but for me it set up certainly conflict between wanting to be noticed and not wanting to be noticed, yeah. which are at play with me just about every day. I have a desperate desire to be noticed, but at the same time if I get attention, the uh, impulse to run away and hide is so strong. It's something I struggle with. How much do you think it actually defined him personally? I mean, he's, you know, it, he's obviously comes across as being pretty distant emotionally in, in ways in the book. That was a very telling moment when you're in the pool and you ask him if, if he loves you. Those qualities aren't unusual for a man of that generation. No, that's true. That emotional stiltedness was very much the, the language of that generation, and it's a shame. I do think it affected him profoundly in the structure of who he was. I recently actually had an email from Richard, uh, one of the other main quiz kids, who, you know, has fond memories of the show. He and Harv joined the show when they were 11, I think. And so I don't think it had the profound impact on them that it did on the younger kids. I think for my father, it actually structured him in a certain way as to the kind of person he was. I think from then on, he internally, at a very deep level, saw himself as someone who answered questions. And that was his role in life. And I think it informed all other kinds of details of his behavior and the way he saw the world. So even when he had escaped the show and his notoriety, that part of it he could not really escape. There's the aspect of him being younger, but also he was clearly the standout. Really beyond the life of the show, he was the one that was sort of like trucked out and introduced to everyone. And that's an extra level of fame and all the trappings that come with it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He was put on show. And it, it's interesting to compare him with Gerard Darrow, who had been the star name before him and had been on the cover of Life, before at age 11 being completely erased from the show and just never mentioned again until his death in the press. Uh, that wouldn't happen these days, obviously. Fame is much more continuing now. You can't escape it the way you could then. Yeah, I think the pressures of always being on show, he responded to it, but it, again, molded him in a way of uh, making him an incredibly self-conscious person who always was was uh, feeling like he was being watched and judged. He obviously retreated to some degree, but he, he wrote a number of books over time as oh, well. Oh, yeah, right? no, he was, he was a successful academic, yeah. uh, you know, philosopher, a teacher. His students really loved him. In fact, I, I have not been reading the reviews on Amazon, um, <laughs> but I, I know because several people have told me there's one from one of his uh, graduate students mm. who, is, who is saying this is not the complete story of the person I knew, which is completely fair. You know, I think he had very special relationships with his students, and he did did, in a way, he built a new life for himself. As far as those complaints go, what do they bring up? What do they feel like was missing from the portrait? Well, I think they feel that he was, uh, you know, he was not someone to them who had been crippled by trauma or, mm. or was incapable of expressing himself. To them, he was a kind and gentle person who was a good teacher and who really helped a lot of people. He really was, you know, I think very considerate person and he gave his students a lot of attention and in some cases he really helped people's careers in ways that were very valuable to them. Do you get the impression that it was easier for him to be sort of open, more open and, and warmer in the context of uh, academics? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So yeah. it's just something that didn't end up trickling over to his own family? No, I mean, I always knew, I always knew, and in a way still do, his intentions were, were always good. He's a kind, decent, moral person. It's just that we had no real relationship beyond just a perfunctory, almost formal one. His students were seeing a softer and more relatable side of him than I was. It is strange that to be speaking about all this in the past tense. I mean, obviously, he's still with us now. He, he's still alive. His mind is nearly completely destroyed, though. It's just there's no... He's, uh, yeah, no, he can't, uh, he cannot 
form a sentence, yeah. and he recognizes very few people. Do you feel that having written this book that, that you were able to sort of come to, I don't know if conclusion is the right word, but, you know, to really kind of to tie that up or to, you know. Well, yeah. I mean, what know. I've done in is, in is in some ways a form of magic. It's a very powerful gesture to take your family's history and rewrite it and assume control of the family narrative, which is in a way what I've done. So as I was saying before we started this, the responses have been pouring in from all sides of the family, from other people who knew him, from other ex-quiz kids. You know, I've taken this story that defined our family but was not to be acknowledged, and I've placed it out in front of everyone to be evaluated at large. So, yeah, I feel like it's it's a huge thing, not just for me personally, but but for all of us. That had to be an incredibly difficult decision on your end, though, knowing that there's a chance that he's not going to sign off on this thing. Yeah. I mean, his uh, dementia beat me to it, basically. I mean, in his current condition, I think people have waved the book in front of him, and uh, I know they have it at the rest home where he is. Yeah. But... um, yeah, he, he passed a point where he was going to really be fully aware of it. Had that not happened, I mean, there was, a, there was an equal chance that he would have completely rejected it. It sounded like he was sort of almost edging in that direction anyway. Yeah, possibly. Is there a sense of guilt around sort of revealing, while he's around or not, this thing that he clearly didn't want to share with the world? Oh, of course, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, you can't avoid that. Yes, and I was very worried as to my mother's reaction, too. I don't think there's that much in the book that's that's really negative about her. But there are a couple sentences I wrestled with and, and decided they were worth it for the book, that they were necessary for the book, and I was worried she'd be upset, and luckily she was not. How much input did she have, or, or were you interviewing her? Were you bouncing things off her in the oh, process? Oh, sure. Uh, some of it, yeah. yes. I mean, she was very helpful, for instance, with uh, reconstructing what happened on that quiz show, mm. which, you know, is complete conjecture on my part, but I think it's very close to what happened. She remembered that he had told her about it earlier in their marriage when yeah. it had not completely been erased from his memory. It sounds like she was in a similar position that you were, that he wasn't willing to disclose any of this with her either throughout the course of the marriage. Yeah, no, not really. She said that um, after they got married, she uh, visited my grandmother Sarah, his mother's apartment for the first time, and my grandma Sarah brought out those scrapbooks, the ones that I discovered, which at that time were hers, and said, now how are we going to get his life back on track? Meaning... How are we going to get him back onto television, which is just deluded? Yeah. Uh, I mean, by the end of his career on television, it was clear he wasn't supposed to be on television. You do touch on this in the, in the book, but, um, you know, while he was still sort of cognizant, he played some role in, in helping you. You did some interviews. He wanted to help, yeah. yeah. And he gave me some interviews. Um, he just had really erased it from his mind so much that there was very little there. And again, he had hidden those scrapbooks. I, I think when his mother died, he hid them in his study in such a way so they were very difficult to find, really hidden in a corner of the room. He had clearly forgotten that. You know, he had forgotten even that he had hidden stuff. He wanted to help me. There was a period where he wanted to help me, but he still couldn't remember that much. And he had very few personal recollections beyond thinking that, you know, he didn't have any feelings about most of these people. The only person he had any personal recollections about really was Jack Benny. He said that he thought Jack (laughs) Benny didn't like him, which was unusual. It's the one person he says he thought didn't like him. (laughs) Does having children, I mean, has that kind of light a fire underneath you as far as, you know, just sort of getting to the bottom of the story and getting... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, that was a huge part of it, too. Absolutely. Because when you have children, you're living through their chronology of their childhood. And as you do it, your chronology of your childhood becomes, comes back to you in sharp relief. I would say before having a kid, my memories of childhood were, you know, a jumbled mess of memories. But as you go through your kid's childhood, you think, oh, so this is when this happened. Because you can see the developmental points and everything starts to fall into place. You know, a lot of being a parent, frankly, has been trying to be a completely different parent than the ones I grew up with and really, you know, rise to the challenge. You know, and I I spend a a huge amount of time with my son and and thinking about my son and what to do for him. And, you know, no matter how, how everything else goes, I'm not sorry for that. I'm very, very happy I've been able to do it. It's an interesting impulse. You know, a lot of cartoonists, when they start having children, they they start making kids they make kids books you know they mm. make things for yeah. sort of more immediate products for for their children to you know appreciate now but this is sort of something that you've gifted to him for his future sure yes and hopefully he won't have to i mean he won't have to do the same amount of archaeology 
on uh, yeah. myself and my wife as uh, we've had to do with my parents because with them, they just, you know, it was, again, it was generational. They just never went through stuff. They never acknowledged psychological issues. Everything got buried. So we've had to go through all their stuff in this house, which just got sold, actually. And, you know, in there was all their parents' stuff because they had just taken all that when their parents died, shoved it somewhere. So we had to go through generations of stuff. The symbolism, it's its almost too on the nose of just taking their things and shoving them in closets. Absolutely, yeah. So um, we've, we've promised each other that we're not going to do that for our son. We're going to take care of our stuff while our, we're around to do it. Did they push you either, you know, actively or otherwise to be a, an academic? I mean, you know, being the child of the smartest boy in the world or however he was positioned at the time, was there this, this notion that, you know, of course you're going to go to, to Harvard and, you know, become a scholar? But they didn't push me, though. And, uh, and, and I think that was uh, partly due to his not acknowledged fear that um, if I became too smart or too visible, then I'd be in for the kind of abuse he got. So, in fact, there was very little academic pushing. And, in fact, I'd say in some ways they sabotaged me. So at what point is it clear that you want to be a cartoonist? Oh, God. Well, not until my 20s. Actually, uh, I mean, my yeah, it, it was trouble. I didn't put down a lot about my childhood. I just put in those high points. But I, I do well, so kind to speak. of so yeah, or how depending on how you see it. Uh, I wanted to summarize it in as little as possible. Frankly, there was a draft as late as late last year where there was more about me, but I, I took it out because I wanted to just have our relationship highlighted but the book is really about him it's also hard. i mean i mean that's the impulse you're constantly fighting writing a uh an auto well a biography like that yeah is how much to insert yourself into absolutely it. absolutely and tons of things went in and tons of things went out my childhood which i i want to write about separately what happened was we uh we were in mansfield and then when i was seven we went to cambridge england in a kind of repeat of his escape and the same as he did, we stayed there for a couple of years and we came back. So by that time, I had been very Anglified. Uh, Cambridge, England is an amazing place to be as a child, or, or was in 19, early 1970s. Was, was there a sense that you were escaping from something again? Well, I think we all felt it even. I mean, recently I was with the, my other family members and him, and we were all talking about how upset we were to come back to America. Because mm. I reminded my mother that she cried on the boat back uh, which is hard to forget. And yeah, I, I wasn't looking forward to coming back to America, even as a nine-year-old. So it, it was difficult because Cambridge is such a, was, and probably still is for all I know, such a liberating place with the smartest people in the world. Mm. There's medieval architecture, a city full of uh, bookshops and theaters. It, it was just so intoxicating. And I was very kind of anglified by the time I came back. I had an accent and, you know, love of wit and theater. And we came back to Mansfield, Connecticut, which was crushing. It was absolutely crushing. And you can see the smile disappear from my face over my school photographs for the next few years. And it never came back properly. And then, you know, it was they were really involved in their careers. We were basically on our own, my sibling and I. And things got worse and worse and tenser and tenser. And we were arguing all the time. And then they, when I was 14, they sent me to private school, which... I think was just a horrendous mistake. I was not prepared for it. I I wasn't I couldn't take care of myself properly. I had had no, you know, training in any life skills we're of talking any about kind. boarding school so you were sh kind of shipped outside of the house? Yeah. So yeah. I was shipped out to a school where there were all these loose rich kids and it was just a horrible experience and really in a way finished me. I mean, I think <laughs> At 14, you were done? No, I mean, at 18, I, I was here. My my father, my father, I think, wanted me to be part of the intelligentsia mm. and to somehow uh, insert me. So he did me. still have a little bit of that impulse? A little bit. I think he kind of wanted me to be in the white intellectual class. But his efforts were so half-assed and poorly prepared and poorly executed that it had the reverse effect. So, in fact, what happened was... By the age of 18, I was and always will be an outsider. What they did was create an outsider. You know, I will always be an outsider. It's part of who I am, my psychology. And somehow I seem to always find myself living out that scenario as well. So that's what my upbringing did for me, really. 
the impulses they had to make me part of the white educated class backfired. And I am enraged, as I think many more people are these days, by the hypocrisy and smug laziness of that class and just the the poor work they do. As a parent, though, going through that, it's got to give you some insight and some empathy into, you know, the fact that like clearly they were trying to do the, the best they could. Eh, I'm not sure that's tr- true. Well, you'd have to really define what the best they could was. I mean, uh, they were doing what the, what the they minimum. thought was best for you, perhaps. <sighs> you no, know, I I think that, honestly they were doing yep. what was best for themselves. I, I I don't know. It's it's hard. I think even now my mother wrestles with this and with private school, and I don't want to come down on her certainly face to face. But it was just disastrous for me. It was just awful. And it just put me further away from normal people. This comes up a lot on the show. We uh, interview a lot of creative types, and we, t- we discuss sort of the importance of finding your group of weirdos, you know, yeah. finding, finding your, your outcasts. I, you know, I always compare it to, like, the, um, the pirate ship on Pinocchio. <laughs> right. Did that come along? Is that, uh, do you have that with the, the comics community? I have that with the comics artists, mm. with other artists, definitely. The comics community, as far as the, the kind of writers and intellectuals mm. who, are, who control a lot of it, I, yeah. I absolutely am an outsider, uh, again. Uh, I feel like I'm not part of the comics community. Uh, I've been, you know, pushed out of it, basically. How so? Well, I mean, I don't... <laughs> You, you were on fan graphics for a while. You have this new book, and it's doing well. And you, you, yeah, you're, you're I know. Covered. From the outside, it might not make sense, but I'm not. You know, up till this book, I, you know, I just I was selling quite well for fan graphics. But it's like I'm not with the ideology of what people, or wasn't at least, with the ide- ideology of what people want to see in comics. I mean, I think that's, humor. I think humor writers ha- might have a tougher time. That that probably part of it. The humor is probably part of it, but. You know, I, I've lived in New York City for over 30 years now. Mm. I am never invited to conventions here or anywhere in the Northeast, mm. pretty much. And if I am, they find some way to make it the most horrifying experience possible. <laughs> well, that's just that's just conventions, Michael. Yeah, but, you know, I'm I'm not considered... I struggle with this a lot. It's like after comics were declared to be an art form, mm-hmm. what happened is that a lot of the structures that mimic fine art sprung up so that means a class of kind of gatekeepers and curators who are very territorial who are writing their own narrative of comics art history and i don't fit into it that's how i feel when do comics really enter the picture for you i I read them when i was younger i read uh you know as a kid in england i read tintin and asterix it uh wasn't till tintin tintin really you've got a real tintin hair haircut in the book i know no it's true (laughs) i i felt that uh, just on a side note i felt like that fitted thematically because um i'd heard a very interesting lecture by a european academic that someone had uh, placed on youtube a few years ago about the myth of the golden child in pre-war uh society tintin was an epitome of that in his lecture but i think in a way my father was also yeah. an example of that uh of the so idea of this why were you the golden child in the book well it's a way of using transference to uh to show the uh <laughs> yeah a somewhat as as people put it a somewhat you know more battered intense looking tintin looking at pictures of tintin projected onto a grown-up you've got a real you're kind of dealing with a man child there, aren't you? I mean, there's something, Absolutely. There's something very boyish in, in his haircut and then projected onto that's, an adult. That's an element of the book, and I'm not going to yeah. pretend. I feel like my parents did not prepare me for life, and that's something that I've had to really struggle with. Does that sort of play out in being a professional comic book artist? Well, I would say absolutely. I mean, certainly the other artists I know, we do share things in common. Mm. And, and and including, I think, with many of us, the struggle between wanting to be noticed and not noticed. Yeah. I think that's a very comic book artist thing. How did they receive the fact that you wanted to do this professionally? Well, I think they were bemused by it. Uh, <laughs> but Like then, this too shall pass? You know, but then I got in The New Yorker, and I was okay. in The New Yorker for years and years. So that for them was yeah. quite enough. Around 20 is when you really sort of pulled the trigger? Oh, no, not till 26. 26. Yeah, yeah. No, no, but 20 is when, when you decide you're going to get into this in earnest? No, uh, I went to fine art school. The truth is I didn't know what I was doing. I uh, yeah. that, that was another problem. I just had no idea. You knew you were artistic and wanted to be an artist? 
I, 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 Not I, even it, that? Yeah, no, I knew I was artistic. I knew I could do it, but I wish I had felt the full range of options because I really didn't. Going to this private school, which had a crappy art department and a crappy theater department and was in Connecticut, I had no experience of the world. I had no idea of how the world worked. See, this is what I'm trying to give my son, yeah. all this stuff. I, th I think that's something that a lot of people deal with, you know, in their, in their 20s going through college. I, don't, I sure. don't know that anybody at this point feels particularly prepared for the real world. Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I do feel like a lot of school and our, our educational system and growing up is about discouraging people's impulses or yeah. trying to get them to channel them. And, Certainly uh, there are vocational schools, things like that. Sure. Whereas, you know, with my son, within reason, I'm just trying to encourage him. Yeah. So, you know, he can feel confidence and feel that he's good and worthwhile no matter what happens and that... Uh, but also to, of course, be kind and humane to other people. The irony that I see here, though, is that, you know, you felt that you weren't encouraged enough. But the thing you think that the thing that a child who gets encouraged a lot in their creative abilities would go on to do would be to become a comic book artist. Well, no, I'm yeah, I'm hoping he feels the range of other options yeah. as well. You tended to, to toward this artistic thing. You tended toward this thing that uh, that people that children often have sort of beat out of them at an earlier age. Well, what happened is I went to school for fine arts. My first year I was at Syracuse, and it was basically like still being in Connecticut. Didn't enjoy it that much. And then I came to New York to School of Visual Arts, and I was studying fine art, but you know, really just experiencing all of it, and finally being around other non-typical people for the first time. And it was hugely liberating. School of Visual Arts at that time didn't have dorms. They housed all the students in the YMCA on 34th Street. This was before the Times Square remodeling and all of that. So it was amazing introduction to a city that was yeah. very anarchic at the time. It was very liberating. So I kind of trundled through the rest of school and did enough to get my degree. But I just was still... I was so behind in a lot of ways. I was still taking it in and processing it. And then a few years later, um, well, a couple of years later, I was in Williamsburg and someone was doing a Xerox comic book. This would have been 89. And, uh, you know, they were just inviting anyone to join in. So I did a page or two and then people really responded to that and I enjoyed the response and you know that's where it started was was comedy an element of it from the beginning yeah I mean I did a couple of serious strips at the beginning but yeah I always found being funny the most appealing and I, I kind of felt like it was a noble thing to do to try to help people laugh I've had that beaten out of me a little but you know also as you can see if you follow me on Twitter making jokes is my stress reaction that's how I don't go crazy so um, it's really something I do almost involuntarily. Does it manifest itself that way, though, in your in your daily life? I mean, are you in person? Are you a funny person to be around? Only if I uh, trust you. OK, you no. Know. Um, <laughs> with ordinary people, I try not to let it show. You know, I don't want to scare the squares. Uh, is it just sort of introversion on your part? Why doesn't why doesn't it come out? Well, I, I find that uh, only some people will follow me where I go in my jokes. Sure. And, you know, a lot of people see it as just being negative if the jokes have a negative tinge, you know. I, I, had, a, I had a first date recently, actually over the weekend, mm. and it was one of those um, stark reminders that, uh, oh, yeah, like, I, and I, I, had a, I, had a, uh, I had a teacher in high school tell me this once, and it, and it stuck with me. I, clearly, like, I haven't um, taken it enough to heart, but she just said, Brian, not everybody understands your sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, so, and I met someone. We got drinks, and then by the end of the conversation, I was just like, "She probably thinks I'm an idiot. She either thinks I'm an idiot or just have really bad opinions because she did not yeah. get a single thing I was saying." Humor is not. I mean, maybe there's some very specific forms of pratfalls, but humor is not universal, yeah. and uh, it it depends on many factors to be communicable. But when I started comics, it wasn't just the humor. I felt like I wanted to try to do new things with comics. I, I, I thought and still do. It's an amazing art form. Social terms, it's incredible. that It can just be a pen and a piece of paper, and you know you can project yourself into that and really create a world on that piece of paper. And uh, I wanted to try all these different things uh, with it and thought I could bring something new to it. Do you think that being pegged as the funny guy has stifled you? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah. totally. As far as what exactly? Well, okay, first of all, I think my work was uh, not written about, mm. and uh, there was 
because there was simply not that much that people could write about. They could say this is funny or not. They could describe what's in it. There wasn't that much that they could write about. There's not that much meaning attached to it. If, for instance, this did occur to me at one point, if I had announced I had a brain disorder or uh, was you know, impaired in some way, I think that would have actually helped my image because it would have given some meaning to this. But um, there was a lack of meaning attached to my work, uh, in some ways deliberately. And I think humor confounds a lot of people, and in comics it's very disrespected, certainly in the kind of comics I work in. What do you mean by attaching meaning? What meaning was it missing? Well, if I had been writing about certain subjects or making certain points, you know, that Mm -hmm. would have lent it meaning. Just that it wasn't tied to any Yeah, that it wasn't didactic world. at all, that it was completely just that you're not a divorced from reality. For example. Right. There was, there's just no, you know, there's nothing that can be attached to it that, that people could write about or identify with. And, you know, maybe that wouldn't have been such a problem 20, 30 years ago, but yeah. it really is now. Was that a fear setting off on this new book, you know, spending all this time working on this? I, not that it could have been a comedy necessarily, but were you wary of going in that entirely different tonal direction? I felt, and, and frankly still do feel, humor comics are pretty much closed to mm. me. I, I can't think of why I would. I mean, I might do them on assignment. It's just not... Oh, I just mean as far as that first step towards something that wasn't humorous. Oh, yeah. The whole thing absolutely was terrifying yeah. and, and nauseatingly uh, just so daunting. Do you have the impulse to, in the way perhaps you would uh, around friends or family, do you have the impulse to like, oh, I want to inject a joke here, but it's wholly inappropriate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All the yeah. time. Yeah, of course. In, I, I, in, I'm in, horrible at Thanksgiving dinner. Th- you know, does that translate to writing a serious book? Uh, you can clearly see the humor in these things. Well, what what it seemed to me and what I chose to believe was that if I could communicate humor to some people, then emotion, um, such as the emotions conveyed in the book, I could convey that too. And emotion does not require the same kinds of specific intelligence or, or intellectual leanings or, or uh, desire to dissect things that humor does. It's much cleaner. So um, it seemed to me likely that if I could communicate hum- humor to some people, I could communicate emotion to a lot of people. So that was part of the guiding principle behind the book. I wanted to make a book that would be readable by anyone, even if they've never read a comic before, and they would learn something and they would feel something. Humor might be the most difficult thing to translate on a written page in that way. There are so many places in the process where it can completely break Absolutely. Down. It's gossamer. And, you know, if you reword one of my jokes a different way, it's completely meaningless yeah. or, or falls flat. But doing the book was Absolutely terrifying. And the scariest part was when I had written at least half of it and had a contract finally to do the rest. I I felt like this is impossible. This was only a year and a half ago or so. I thought this is absolutely impossible because it was a very short amount of time to finish the book, too. So I was just paralyzed with terror for a bit. You set out to do this prior to having signed anything. There was no you had no notion whether or not it was was going to be published. I actually I met with an agent, uh, Scott Mendel who's my agent, and uh, we developed the book first. And he was very helpful at pointing out the emotional components that would need to be there. What was the most time-consuming part of the process of creating this? Writing and uh, writing it, yeah. Okay. The research took a while, but then it was writing it that was just such a struggle to make it into a story. So that point a year and a half ago, you still hadn't finished the words? No, I didn't finish the story. I didn't finish writing the book completely until about last September. October, November, yeah. something like that. I finished the book, the insides of the book in January. Revisions took through February, and then the cover was March. So I finished all of it at the end of March, and then the book came out May 15th, which was an amazingly short time. Did you have enough time to draw? <laughs> I suspect that, you know, given that kind of timeline, you weren't able to spend nearly as much time drawing it as you might have liked to have. Okay, here's here's where we get to where I might I do things differently than other people do. For the oh, this is where it starts? <laughs> <laughs> this is really a, a steep point. For the writing of the book, there was a period where I did not take any other work. I just concentrated on the writing because any other distractions, you know, I wanted to remove. When it came time to draw the book, my feeling was I tend sometimes to be too fussy in my artwork. That's, to me, been a weakness of it. You're a perfectionist? 
I am I'm a perfectionist, and if I start to get into you know yep. a very minute detailed scenario, I can get lost in it. In a drawing, spend just hatching. Yeah, 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 exactly. Or you know, just doing work that. And what I wanted this book to be most uh, of all was very simple graphically and have great flow. So I actually pulled some tricks on myself. I I worked much closer to size than I normally do. Mm. That's one thing. But the other thing I did, I already had these 224 pages to do, which seemed absolutely impossible. I took on a lot of extra work. So for that last year, while I was drawing the book, I took on extra work so that I was doing other comics while I was doing the book because I wanted the style to be one of constant work, if that makes sense. I didn't want it to be precious, fussed over drawings. I wanted it to be drawings that you know, whip by. To me, doing extra work, besides the fact that I, I needed the money, it helped me feel like I was, it was in a flow of cartooning. Especially living in New York, especially having a family. I mean, that's, that's a nice luxury, being able to drop all of those other things at once. Yeah, no, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. It was very hard. And of course, you know, in a family, there's a certain amount of time and attention you have to give to the family. Yeah. I've certainly learned through my life not to let things out on other people too much and to try to always give them the time they need. It sounded like you were alluding to the fact that you might be done with humor. I just don't see where I can go for them. I mean, I, 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 I probably will continue to do pieces for places like, I don't know, The New Yorker or yeah. Heavy Metal or whatever. I mean, it sounds like the work you were doing would have been rewarding from that perspective. The sales weren't good enough okay. to justify uh, interest from others, basically. To me, my very first book, uh, Snake and Bacon's Cartoon Cabaret, mm -hmm. Uh, really illustrates this because it's also the difference between the 20th and 21st centuries. Avon Books hired me to do that book in 98, I think. They had seen me in Oxford American and Heavy Metal. They were excited because they thought my work was cool and they wanted to show it to people. But then they were taken over by HarperCollins, and my book came out in 2000, and HarperCollins illustrates the 21st century model, which is if it doesn't already have demonstrated enormous sales or numbers online of some kind, we're not interested. You're feeling squeezed as much as you know any of us are as, as far as just kind of the internet. I mean, people not necessarily buying books the way they were before. Having had the successes that you've had with this particular book, do you think that this form of storytelling is a way forward for you? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. This is where I think I'm going to be going from now on, yeah. Just doing more serious work doing i mean I, I i hesitate to use the word memoir because i this isn't that right yeah no i i mean it's certainly there was so much material and so much i wanted to put in yeah. this book and and couldn't that there's certainly a lot i still want to do you know a lot of stories i want to tell about that house and and my childhood and uh, other things you know, some sad, some funny. But as far as just, you know, for that book, I just want it to be the most focused story yeah. possible. But you can see yourself for the next couple of projects continuing to focus on yourself or the world around you? Yeah, I would hope so. Yeah. I mean, again, it certainly depends on how well this book does. And, you know, to me, it, I, it, it's doing quite well critically. But, you know, it really remains to be seen because it's all about the numbers. When does that make itself clear? Still takes time. I mean, um, the graphic novel company who, who published it, Gallery 13, their division of Simon & Schuster, they don't have much promotional backing. They don't have a budget. They yeah. don't in many ways know what they're doing. So in some ways, this book is a sleeper. I mean, I just say that despite it having gotten some very good press early on. You know, it still has to really find more of an audience. And, and for me, I think uh, you know, word of mouth is what's really going to carry this book. Because I do think it's it's a book that people will have feelings after reading and, and will hopefully recommend to others. It's not gauged the same way a, a movie is, for example. If it doesn't, if it's not an immediate huge blockbuster out of the gate, it can still continue to grow from there. I would hope so. It's hard <laughs> to tell. I mean, I'll yeah. be honest, my editor quit uh, a couple of weeks ago, which is not a good sign as to the company. Okay. You know. Um, but surely no reflection on your... I wouldn't think so, and I, I'm very <laughs> proud of the book. I have no, I, yeah. I don't have a lot of doubts about the book. I, I worked hard on it and didn't cut corners, and I created the book I wanted to, and I think it will find an audience. As far as the publishing world, it is just an absolute crazy topsy-turvy yeah. thing where no one knows what they're, they're doing. No one seems to know how to sell graphic novels at all. 
anywhere apart from maybe drawn in quarterly it, it's just completely confusion city you know it doesn't sound like in your professional career as a cartoonist that you've ever really felt true stability no no it's been amazing insecurity i mean that's the age we're living in i look at the careers of older cartoonists not that i'm like them i'm very unlike them but people used to have careers of yep. decades where they would do mediocre work and gradually develop and do great work and that's not a thing anymore now you know you find your way into comic section people are bored within six months it's closed you know this is the regular occurrence there's not there's never that kind of or rarely that kind of security and i've certainly never found it i've bounced from you know place to place to place you know from gig to gig and uh yeah basically i'm a i'm a ronin has it gotten worse over time or oh yeah so much yeah. worse so much worse oh in the 90s when i started it was tough but there were many publications there were many places to practice your craft there were professional art directors who actually would have insightful and helpful things to say about the work and help you make it better now you're pretty much dealing with scared office drones who are go-betweens between you and an editor. It's gotten worse in every way. The money has gotten nightmarishly bad. If you do illustration now, you're being paid far less than you would have in the 1950s. You know, And there's no security. There's no loyalty whatsoever. And the editorial process has gotten stupider and stupider so that you're not going to be allowed to do good work very often anyway. I think it's good for your own peace of mind that you're able to gauge those external forces and, and not take it too personally. You're at a point in your career where you're obviously at the top of your game and you've been doing this for a long time. You're established. It's hard not to take those things to heart. The fact that you don't have the stability that you probably should have at this point in your career. Yeah, no, it's horrifying. It's absolutely horrifying. You know, it's it's kept me fit and sharp. I'll yeah. say that. But it, yeah, it's not an easy way to live. And, and my wife and I pray pretty much every day that our level of stress will someday diminish because it is intense to live this way. But what can you do? I mean, what's really surprised and saddened me is even by the low expectations I had, the response of kind of the alternative comics pundits and stuff, you know, the people who organize conventions yeah. and stuff has been so poor. My book is one of, I know of one other graphic novel for adults coming out from a major publisher this year that I can think of. I don't, there probably are others, but it's rare. I, I find the lack of support really pathetic, frankly. You feel though that this is the best thing you've done? Oh, yes, absolutely. There's not really much you could do. You've been doing this for so long. I mean, this is the thing that you've been you've been building up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I had dreams at one point that someone might hire me to write uh, on TV or yeah. movies, but I've just... You have a lot of friends to... in the comedy world. That never I know, came to I know, and I've gotten zero offers pretty much. Really? It's, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I think in some ways being a cartoonist really does stifle you. You know, when Conan O'Brien described me as the one of the greatest comedy brains on the planet, possibly, I... You expected them to just start well, knocking down I your door? No, because I've been around too much. But, you know, if I'd been a writer or a comedian, I think I would have gotten job offers. Yeah, it must be hard. You know, you in, in some ways you remind me of Tom Sharpling. You know, I think he... Because he, he goes through this a lot, too. He's, he always has this complaint of, you know, being... I wish I was in Tom Sharpling's shoes. Sure, yeah. but, but but comedy and Jason in the way that he is and that he's not sure. like a known for being a television writer is constantly complaining about the fact that like he's not getting the deals that he has and maybe it's just this people can't see something translating from one medium to another, you know, of, of, of No, it's true. Being people a funny, are supposed to have one job yeah. and that's it. Yeah. So those offers just never never came. No, never got one offer. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shame. I mean, you know, I, uh, Adult Swim keeps asking me to pitch cartoons, so I'll probably be doing that again soon. Yeah. But, you had a you know, we'll see. short, right? Wasn't there a snake in I had one. I had a pilot with them. Yeah. It didn't go anywhere. I mean, I think, again, um, there was an economic crash going yeah. on when Snake and Bacon the book came out. There was an economic crash coming out when going on when Snake and Bacon the show came on. I mean, I think my career has also been hobbled by economic crashes. You still enjoy, though, writing and drawing? Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's wonderfully liberating. What That's what I want maybe most of all. I don't want to be rich or anything. The greatest thing I can think of is to feel creatively enabled because yeah. that is the most exciting thing in the world and takes you out of the misery that is living, let's face it. You know, being creatively enabled and feeling like you're doing something, that's that's just wonderful. It's like flying. This latest book was the most fulfilling thing you've done and, and from that standpoint? Oh, yeah, I'd say so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I really, I put my all into it. I, I lettered every part of the book except the barcode because I wanted it to be absolutely everything done by hand, everything, you know, 
done by me. Once once the book is finished, and, and it sounds like, you know, those last couple of miles were the most difficult or certainly the most frantic. Yes. Um, how soon do you throw yourself into the next thing? Well, frankly, I'm still exhausted from that book. Yeah. And then um, what I had to throw myself into was promoting it. Because, again, um, you know, my publisher doesn't didn't really have any ideas. I have to say the promotional person they've assigned to me, she's been fantastic. Mm. She has really no experience, but she's got a great attitude and she's... You know, she brings it. But I've had to initiate a lot of what yeah. has happened promotionally, and it's it's just exhausting, and it, and it really is a uphill struggle. I mean, there are some places where I've really, you know, felt like I was making progress, and it just never went anywhere. To the know. point where you can't even really consider what's next on your plate? Yeah, it's really difficult right now. Yeah. yeah, it really is. There are things that I want to do, and there are things that maybe I should do, and it's, yeah, it's a little dizzying right now. Do they just sort of make themselves known to you? Well, I mean, again, money is the big, uh, yeah. you know, the big uh, dog as far as career considerations. You cast a, a lot of reels and see. see yeah, what... and and I'm hoping there will be uh, an adaptation, a cinematic yeah. adaptation of this book or uh, TV. So that's another thing I'm I'm hoping will happen. But uh, yeah, right now I'm still kind of considering my options. I do have some work to do. Uh, my my agent is Scott is on my back to figure out what's next. There you go. That was Michael Kupperman. Thanks so much to him for taking the time to do that. His new book, All the Answers, is out now on Gallery 13. Easily one of my favorite comics of the year. Highly recommend you pick it up. Thanks to him. Thanks to you guys, as always, for listening to the show. If you like the program, there are a number of ways to support us. You can rate and review us on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or wherever you happen to get your podcasts. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Tumblr. That's riolcast.tumblr.com. That is the first and best place to get all of our IYL-related information. And I think that's about it for this week. We have a couple more bonus episodes coming up so stick around for those and stick around because we will be back just about this time next week with another episode of riyl 